Good morning, my name is Jennifer Yates and I've been in the corporate work world for over 25 years and I, no, I just left my job three weeks ago to start my own business. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's called Operate Accelerate and I help small businesses with their business operations, so I'm in the back office creating processes, workflows, doing matrix project management so that everyone at work is a lot happier with what they're doing and the, the leaders of the business can concentrate on their vision rather than the sand that's in their gears. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Glyon. I'm not new new. I'm actually kind of a, a comeback kid. Um, used to be, um, have had a, a career in um, economic development in Ypsilanti, Downtown Development Authority, left to do arts advocacy work at the statewide and national levels um, with a group, um, Arts of Michigan, that became Creative Many Michigan. And um, I'm just um, new, in a new position with Found in Carytown, um, having just more fun than anything, helping people like Rob do lots of shopping for his lovely wife. Um, and um, helping to really elevate the power of artists and local makers and designers and from across the country and internationally that are so core to our story. So helping to do community outreach and um, uh, elevate um, the power of makers um, in our midst and our, in our economy. So happy to be here. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Carol Dunnitz. I'm a professional, write professional writer and strategist uh, I've done speaking myself, but I've also written speeches for high-level executives, like a former chairman of General Motors. Uh, I've created ad campaigns for mid-sized companies, uh, written four musicals and toured in one, uh, seven books. So I do all kinds of writing. My specialty is taking anything and making it interesting and easy to understand. If you need help with that, please come see me. Yes, I'm one of the catering managers here at the Roadhouse. Gotcha, thank you. <laughs> Very close. Heard. I'm at Sierra. I'm one of the catering managers here at the Roadhouse. We're happy to have y'all here today. Um, I noticed some of you got some breakfast pastries and tacos. That's awesome. We're actually running a promotion right now. The Texas breakfast tacos are new to our catering menu. Um, if you order 20 or more tacos through the catering department, you'll get a free taco t-shirt, which I'm wearing and Ari's also wearing. <laughs> so. <laughs> If you love breakfast tacos or love t-shirts or need anything through the catering department, feel free to let us know. There's some promotional material on your chairs and also some business cards over on the table there for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'll just say for Argus, it was, the concept for it was really founded like nine years ago, almost in this room, exactly listening to Ari talk about vision and getting inspired about what you might be able to do that's different than what you had been doing and then being coached by Rob um, in detail with, a, with one of his groups, you know, where the concept for Argus went on the blackboard and was challenged and pressed, and then finally, you know, um, you know, a year later, we, we opened it. So Argus had its root really in this kind of audience and this, with these two guys. Um, and <laughs> yeah, right, sandwiched between the, the two inspirers. Um, and then Ego Therapeutics is a spin out from University of Michigan really smart scientists, James Moon and Anna Schlendeman, um, had a breakthrough about how to deliver autoimmune therapies. And so, uh, again, just surrounded by the, the, the smart people there, but the, uh, uh, the technology uh, is gonna potentially allow a different way to treat autoimmune diseases. And so we've just been in um, good fortune to have a collaboration signed with Amgen, and then we announced one two weeks ago with Gilead, which is another big pharma company. People are impressed by doing it, but you just throw out some numbers. Just <laughs> yeah, so in pharmaceutical companies, you do deals um, where they include, in the press release, they're limited what they can say, but they, they, they let you announce the dollar amount if everything goes perfectly. Uh -huh. Like for now, for the next 20 years, and it's 650 million um, with Gilead. Um, so it's a big one, but they call them bio dollars. Is uh, it's kind of a handicap, so you kind of have to. It's it's better than monopoly money, but it's um, but it's more importantly, it's just it's the team that's coming there from Gilead, 
you know, multiplies by 10 what we could do on our own, and they provide full funding for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are the two that they're taking on. So two big diseases, and we're really happy to have them. Sonic Lunch. I just I just uh, found out we've, we've booked a few bands for Sonic Lunch, so it's coming back this summer. I'm not going to spoil the announcements, but uh, yeah, it'll be back again this summer. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm just super excited to see everybody be here, be here in person. Uh, you know, Happy New Year. Welcome to Leaders Connect 2023. It's just great to uh, be back in person and seeing everybody. Um, and Rob, I really appreciate you bringing this back again. Um, Rob's kind of a community asset here. Uh, we're so happy. We've been sponsoring this program for a number of years. Um, you know, but Rob's the guy that makes all this happen. So if we could give Rob a big up hand, this would be thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, Maureen, uh, where's Maureen out there? I just talked to her. Uh, Maureen came up to me at the early and said something really gracious and uh, made me feel good. And that is, during the first part of the COVID, uh, we kept Leaders Connect going uh, through Zoom. And we did that almost weekly for a while, and then it went to kind of every other week. But we had people like doctors, nurses, Marines and nurse, uh, coming in and informing us about what's going on to keep, keep ourselves apprised what's happening in our community, not just nationally, about COVID. And that went on, uh, gosh, you know, I think we just stopped when we, we came back live. So that was, a, she congratulated me and said that was something that kept her going. Uh, so she was sitting at home, so I'm really thrilled to, uh, to have you. COVID was, was devastating. I'm wearing this eye patch, and I think it's related to COVID, because when I, when I had COVID, uh, I had glaucoma, and basically it really kicked off some problems with the glaucoma. Now I have to have a, a procedure, like it's, it's a minor surgery, but it's, it's replacing, uh, it's a cornea transplant is what it is. Yeah, it's not minor. It's minor to get me out of the we get me out of the hospital real quick. But that's what's minor to say. But anyway, uh, I think we, we all know how devastating COVID was. That the businesses uh, in ways that you, you don't really expect the individuals who are still suffering. We really don't know what was caused by COVID. What was caused by the COVID uh, immunization process. But we know a lot of people who are still having s symptoms in the long COVID. It's better now, I think, in terms of the long COVID. We don't know. I mean, you know, I asked my doctor, but he said, I don't know. You know, I've heard incidental, but I don't know whether COVID caused eye problems. You know, because people can't say. So anyway, uh, maybe you will come up and bring it in this office over there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, Rob, thanks. This is four years, and one of the industries that has massively changed in four years is the office uh, business. Um, we started we started with Rob before COVID. Uh, we went through COVID. Luckily, we've been open about a year, year and a half before that hit. But now, coming on the outside, I've seen a massive change. Um, how many people here work remote? I mean, I work remote. Did you work remote? Just ask yourself, did, did you work remote before? COVID and are you remote after? Because um, so we do dedicated offices. I wanted to do a little visioning thing where I was like, we have art up on the walls and we imagine reimagine the office where every day is a networking event, kind of like this. We have a hundred, we have a hundred and twenty businesses represented wow. in one way or another, and they're all small businesses. Um, and I want to invite anybody just to come and check it out. But we we change, we use local artists. I'm having a lot of fun with it. But uh, if you're working remote and you need to get out of the house, um, I hope you'll come and just check us out for a day. If you're if you're down massively downsizing, which a lot of people are doing, we get regular. We had 60 people now, five people come in. Um, you know, we can do dedicated offices for you too. We have a dedicated receptionist. So it's kind of a turnkey operation. So, but we've seen it change a lot in four years. Yeah, tell them where you're at. Um, we're at 94 in State. We're here. We're, we're dead center between Olive Garden and Mediterranean. If you, if you know where that's at, we're the third floor of that building there. Which you prefer to I'm, I'm a Mediterranean guy, so <laughs> they know us there. But we're looking to expand too because we're seeing a, a big demand in this type of business. So. Oh, right. Who else? You, I'll let you comment on these. Do they know who the They already know. Who's his partner? 
Yeah. Second. All right. Great. Now Zingerman's has many uh, businesses. And Zingerman's it, the, now they have top. They are at five businesses. True or false? And how many are there? Eight. We hear eight. How many else? Anybody else? Thirteen. All right. Depends how you count. I don't know. Twelve. We'll, we'll say twelve. I count the Hebrew way, which is right, you know, right left. left. Uh, all right. Well, they got that one. You're doing pretty good here. Um, I'm going to get a little harder. Uh, the first Zingerman's was inside the Carytown Market. That's a tough one. The first Zingerman's was in the Carytown Market. Yes. True or false? True. Oh, yes. True. 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 False. How many raise your hand? False. How many don't know? <laughs> Ari, where is the first Ziggerman's? They know. Detroit Street. Same place it is now. <laughs> so my relationship with Ari started about the second day they opened the deli because I was really excited. There's a deli now in Ann Arbor. And I went in there and there were two guys behind this little counter. It used to be like a little grocery store, like a unstocked, you know, uh, grocery store like a third-rate bodega, you know, kind of thing. Just had nothing to do. And uh, there was Paul and, and uh, Ari behind the, uh, I think they were slicing meat or something like that. Is it cutting bread? I, I don't remember when you came in, but that could, <laughs> but that could, that, that would make sense. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, that's what we were doing. Yeah, I looked like Steven Spielberg, so maybe you, I, mean, I thought it was Steven Spielberg. I, if I knew who he was, I might have uh, known. <laughs> All right, well, let's see, we're, we're going to keep going here. So it's, Ari doesn't even know how, how many was there. Um, the original name of Zingerman's is not Zingerman's, but they had to change it to Zingerman's because of a, uh, like a legal thing. Somebody else had that name. So an extra, uh, I'll actually throw in one of my books, uh, one of 13 books, no, I have one of eight books. Uh, if you can get this right, what was the original name that they were going to use for Zingerman's? Greenbergs. Greenbergs? It's too fucking tempting on this side. This is yeah, Greenfield. So what else do we hear? Walmart. Sam's. Walmart. Sam's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, what was it? Rich got it. Greenbergs? Yeah. Uh -huh. Was that it? Greenbergs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Greenbergs, all right. Uh, well, that's the, so they, why did you have to change it? Like, was a, somebody challenged you on it? Is it well, we weren't open yet. Yeah. Yeah, somebody else had the name okay. legally assigned. All right, All right. well, uh, so that's, you're doing pretty well. Uh, <coughs> then, um, this is a tough one, too. Uh, Zingerman's is known for making the best corned beef in the world, or, or at least in Bush. It's known for making its own corned beef, true or false? True, I'm going to raise this true. Raise your hand if you think it's true. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's false. And if you don't know, you don't get a corporate sale. All right, true or false? Well, Cy Ginsburg's been making it for us for 41 years. Cy yes. yeah. Ginsburg out of Detroit, so that, that's a tough one. So I think that's enough uh, right now. I think people are pretty well... Yeah. Uh, pretty well uh, up to date. Uh, they are. The That's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other one is this is the last one. Ari is quite young, so Zingerman's has been going for ten years because Ari started it when he was ten. And so, uh, it's, okay. Ari, how many years is it this year? Thirty-seven, something like that. No, it's going to be forty-one years 41. in uh, wow. in yeah. nine yeah. weeks. Yeah. Eight weeks. Mike, right? Correct. I have this mic. Okay, well, let's let the artist going to talk about visioning and uh, walk you through the process, and maybe give you an opportunity to think about your, your own business in terms of visioning. So, Ari, right, you can take it away. Well, I, I'm going to say you always have an opportunity to think about your own future. Nobody's stopping you. But <clears throat> good morning. Good morning. I'm most anxious presenting when I know, mo like, I, I can't remember which of the 6,000 podcasts that I've done. Uh, but they were asking me about venues, and I realized that the, mo the most anxious I've ever been presenting was not Michigan Stadium to 50,000 people, but was like when I went back to my 
parents' synagogue <laughs> when the Guide to Good Eating came out a million years ago and like my second grade teacher was there. Like it's <laughs> like you're transported back <laughs> to being nine and that was, that was the most anxiety ever presenting. So uh, good morning, it, uh, that's a lead in to say I know almost everybody in this room, uh, but I'm honored that you're here and I let my computer lapse, so hang on one second. Yeah, while he's doing that, I want to thank Bill Hall, who's uh, you right here. Bill, can you say hi? And Bill is doing a video today, which will be available on Monday. It will be a little bit of write-up about this, too. So uh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> and Bill, you have a business, too, where you do this. What's your business? Well, I can't oh. really use that because I have to use yeah, my hands. Sure. But I'll talk what louder. Yeah, um, Icon Videography with my partner, Tom, back there, who really runs the business. Hi, Tom. <clears throat> and we shoot uh, live events and um, memorials. Okay. So those are live events and dead events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the dead events have dropped off a lot. Thank you. Are we ready? We should start? Okay, let's start. Timothy Snyder, anybody know who he is? Awesome. Okay, so he is uh, amazing, I think. Uh, he's probably the leading uh, American historian on Ukraine, uh, but he's written a number of fascinating things, and you will find a plethora of talks online by him. But he says, we've never, we've never been in a time where thinking about the future has been so impoverished. We've never been in a time where thinking about the future is so impoverished. Uh, Emma Goldman who was equally interesting but lived 100 years earlier, said, when we can't dream any longer, we die. So if you put those two together, it bodes ill. But the reality is, there's no reason for us not to be thinking about the future other than that people have trapped, we've allowed ourselves, I'm not talking about you or me per se, but we've allowed ourselves to be trapped in a bad loop because there's nothing stopping anybody in this room or anybody anywhere who knows how to just sit down and write the story of their future. And it takes less time to write the story of their future in a powerful and effective way than most people now spend on social media in a day. And that's not an exaggeration. So this work that I'll share with you briefly today, I, I will say without question, uh, has changed my life. Uh, I would not be here without it. Zingerman's would not still be here without it. Uh, if it was, it's pretty clear to me and Rich and others who I talk to regularly. No, I mean, we would have ended up going down one of the main paths. We would have sold it. We would have franchised. We would have ended our, Paul and I would have ended our relationship decades ago because when you don't have a shared vision. So not that Zingerman's is remotely the most important part of Ann Arbor, but if you start to imagine what this little process has impacted, and then I know people like Rich and others in this room that have used it, small things can make a really big difference, okay? So this is, uh, today is focused around the most recent pamphlet, and I just thought, why not just read you a story? <laughs> Early in the 20th century, Rudolf Steiner, educator, philosopher, and the founder of biodynamics said, we tell our story until it tells us. What follows is just that. It's me, the co-founding partner of the Zingerman's Community of Businesses, telling the story of our organization. At the same time, it's me trying to get out of the way to let our organizational story speak for itself. Nearly 30 years ago, I first heard Staj Kazmierski share the story of a very different process for creating our futures. It was about what we at Zingerman's now call visioning. While the term vision is widely used and the concept of it is almost universally applauded, the way we do it here 
is different from how it's handled in the mainstream work world. As you'll read in the first essay, when Stosh first shared the visioning process with us, I was very skeptical. Over the years that over the over the years, that initial cynicism has been converted 180 degrees. Today in 2022, I'm an ardent advocate. So I am like the convert who started with like, I would never do this. This is not how I was raised at all. Uh, my anxiety would have never let me tell you what I really wanted because God forbid it would not happen. I would jinx myself in what we call a very hebonic <clears throat> uh, manifestation of fear. But this process, like I said, has changed my life. It's become an integral part of everything we do here. Uh, it's not just about writing the vision for your organization. It's really a way of life. Uh, and I, I will tell one quick story, and then I'm going to move into some stories of visioning. But uh, Sierra will know the person I'm going to talk about. But so. When, when this is really used in a powerfully effective way, it's not just, like I said, about writing the vision for your organizational future. It's a way of teaching people to think so that the impoverishment of thinking about the future that Timothy Snyder has alerted us to can be diminished because everybody can learn to do this. It's a way of thinking and a way of being in the world. So the other day I was standing here with Zach was at the counter, one of the managers here, who's been started as a bus boy probably, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And, uh, you know, I said, how's it going? And, you know, we, we, we do a lot of work here around energy management uh, and fairly attuned to energy. Many of you are, I'm sure, as well. And I could tell, even though he said he was fine, that he wasn't fine. So I just sort of stood there and I'm like, yeah, what's going on? And he's like, oh, just, I'm so frustrated. And I was like, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm writing a vision now. So I said, well, what's up? He goes, well, I got really frustrated with this situation. He described what happened. And it's awesome is that within a matter of minutes, he took a walk around the building and came back in. And instead of being stuck, being mad about what happened, he was writing out the story of what he wanted to happen. So try to imagine the ability to do that if that were happening at a national level. If instead of all of this, people took a deep breath, took a walk around metaphorically their building and sat down and in 10 minutes, from working from the heart, described the future that they wanted to create. That's really what this whole thing is about. Uh, Gareth Higgins, uh, who I have become good friends with in the last year, uh, whose book, How Not to Be Afraid, I would highly recommend, as well as his other little book, The Seventh Story, that he co-wrote with Brian McLaren, and he was standing right up here in October uh, doing a book event. We'll get him back to do another one. But he says, imagining a new story is a privilege. It is also our responsibility. Everybody in this room, by definition, is committed to community. Everybody in this room is committed to their organization, to their family, to making a positive change. But if we don't write the story of the future, then the story of others takes over. <laughs> and so in, a, in, a, in nature, it's commonly said like in the study of permaculture whatever nature abhors a vacuum so when there's a vacuum of anything growing nature will fill it in with weeds this is what happens you know this on your own property or you well it's the truth and it's true metaphorically in organizational ecosystems too where there is no vision people will fill in their own story so it's our responsibility and our privilege is that we have the opportunity to write the story we want to write, not to just be stuck reacting to the stories that others write for us that we don't like. Because in the end of the day, although it's sort of calming to get mad and complain, actually nothing good comes from it. And in the same time that we've all been trained, me included, 
to complain about this one, that one, or the other one. Again, we could just sit down and do what Zach did and just say what we want. <laughs> so, Gareth also says that the story we tell ourselves about the world is the single most important element in determining our happiness and the kind of life we will lead. So going back to Rob's reference to that Harvard study that came out, if you want good relationships, we can write the story. <laughs> it's up to us. Whatever we want to do, it's up to us to write the story. And this has been my learning. So let me tell you a few stories uh, about Zingerman's then. In the pamphlet, I mean, Rebecca Solnit, anybody know her work? So she said that deciding where a story begins is like dipping a cup in the ocean. Because really, where does your story begin? Does it begin when I learned how to read? Does it begin with when my grandparents came from Eastern Europe? I don't even know where my great-grandparents lived in Eastern You know, it's where does the story begin? And so you can really begin it wherever you want. <laughs> There's not a good one or a bad one. But in this pamphlet, I chose to start the Zingerman story not in 1982 when we opened, because that's the way it's usually told, but to start it in 1993, <clears throat> which is when we learned about visioning. Because, like I said already, visioning changed our lives, it changed my life, and we wouldn't be sitting in this room without it. Okay, So when we opened the deli in, the eight, in 1982, we never talked about vision. Clearly, I knew the word but we didn't really talk about it. It wasn't something that was <clears throat> in our minds. But in part one of the book, which is the yellow one over there, there's an essay called Natural Laws of Business, and the first on Natural Laws of Business, and natural laws are just like what they sound like. It's like gravity, it's just true. You could be a gravity denier, but it won't make gravity any. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Seth Godin said. He goes, how come you don't hear about any gravity deniers? <laughs> It's a natural law of business and life that everybody that's getting to greatness has a vision. Those guys are running the uh, science committee now in the house. Yeah, it's, don't, we're going to steer to the positive today. <laughs> but yes, so we had a vision in our heads, but we didn't know anything about writing it down. This is true for most of you in this room that started a business or a nonprofit or that are parenting or whatever. It's a natural human process. We didn't write it down. We didn't say we had a vision, but we had one. We knew from the beginning that we wanted great food, great service, great place for people to work. There were only two employees, but we wanted it to be a positive work experience. We knew from the beginning that we wanted to be grounded in the community, and we knew from the beginning that we only wanted one, and we wanted it to be a very special place, not a copy of something from New York or Chicago or LA no, or Detroit, no disrespect to those. It's just this belief has become ever stronger for me. It's detailed in much more, uh, in much more, it's detailed in much more detail. It's in the Art of Business pamphlet in far more detail. Uh, but anyway, fast coming back to 1993. So we had already expanded the uh, deli. Some of you were there, 1986. We added on that little pie-shaped piece. It's hard to remember when we opened. It was just that narrow building. <clears throat> and in 1991, we had renovated the house next door, which many of you have been in. And uh, in 1993, in the summer, one day, about 10 o'clock in the morning, when I should have been inside getting the sandwich line ready for the lunch rush, so Rob could come in, <clears throat> Paul grabbed me and he sat me down on the bench out front of the deli, and he kind of looked at me. And he goes, okay, in 10 years, what are we doing? I was like, what? He's like, in 10 years, what are we doing? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, well, really, I mean, we said we only wanted one. We've turned down these offers from other cities. People are opening on campus. It's not as good, but they're copying us. It's eating into our market. What are we doing? I mean, 
are we still here? Have we sold the business? What are we doing? And I'm like, Paul, man, I don't know. I got work to do. And he's like, no, this is our work. <laughs> In hindsight, I know enough to know that what he was asking me is, what's your vision? <clears throat> I don't think that he had a vision. And I certainly didn't have another vision. But what he did have was a very strong, intuitive sense that we had fulfilled the original vision. This is the organizational equivalent of midlife. It's the organizational equivalent of finishing college. It's the organizational equivalent of your kids grow up and move out of the house. It's the organizational equivalent of I'm retiring and now I don't know what to do. John O'Donohue calls them thresholds, right? But there's no dashboard light that comes on that says vision fulfilled if you didn't write it down and you didn't put a date on it the way we now do it, <clears throat> how would you know that it was done? Right? So in hindsight, I realize he probably couldn't have sleep for three or four months worrying about it. <laughs> and then he unloaded his stress on me without any warning, but it was a very good question. And it was only because of that question that we started the work that became our first vision. So we were, all of us are products of our ecosystem. In a great way, we are very much of Ann Arbor. That was our intent, and it's true. Uh, and so uh, one of the nice things of where we are is there's amazing people around us, including in this room, all the time. Uh, Rick Price, uh, who retired from organizational studies a few years ago, he said when he came here from Indiana <clears throat> University in, in Bloomington and they were recruiting him, he said they told him, the great thing about Ann Arbor is that if you throw a stick, you'll hit somebody that's world famous in their field. And, and that the great thing is they'll help you. So anyway, while we were struggling with Paul throwing this question at me and me trying to get him off my back so I could take care of business in the day to day, uh, I started, or he started, I really don't remember. This is part of the thing of stories. It's hard to remember what really happened. One of us started talking to Stash Kazmierski. And Stash passed away five and a half years ago and we still miss him deeply. He changed my life. Uh, and Stash at that time was a partner in a firm that some of you will remember called Dana Miller Tyson. And I didn't really know Kathy Dana Miller. She was on the board of the ARC, among other things. But she was known nationwide for her creative, progressive, organizational change methodology. Our adaptation of that is another talk, which is the bottom line change process, which is also an integral part of how we work here at Zingerman's. But Stash had been a partner, had been an internal consultant. I don't really know what that meant, but that's what he always told me at Ford. Some of you work there, so you know what it is. Uh, and he had, he had one day apparently brought in a guy named Ron Lippett, who had been at the Institute of Social Research to do work in Ford around what Ron Lippett called preferred futuring, right? And Stash knew this process and it had become a big part of what he taught and the work that he did. And so when I was telling him that Paul had asked me this and da da da, we were trying to figure out what we were doing, that's where we learned about this process. Okay, so it was, it happened in the next door over a cup of coffee because Stash liked coffee and I don't have an office. Some of you work in them, some of you should go lease one, but uh, <laughs> my, my office just moves around in that bag. But anyway, Stash, as I understand, wanted to get out of the office and they were, their office was down the block from the deli, so they would just walk down there every time they needed to move their legs and their brain and come get coffee and that's how we knew them. So we started talking to them and we ended up engaging them. Uh, we didn't have much money, but fortunately they were willing to trade food for part of their fee. <clears throat> and that's how we started to work around visioning. So the Zingerman story that in a lot of ways makes what happened, what is going on today is almost more 
tied to that story of 1993 then to 1982. Because it's during the year of 1993 and into 1994 that Paul and I spent a lot of long walks and a lot of long talks and a lot of frustration and a lot of swear words, but continually, as we still do, coming back to the table to figure out the answer to his question. And Stash was who we hired to help us to guide the process, not to tell us what to do. He's not, it's not a consultant who advises you on, here's what food businesses need to be doing. It's somebody who can help, it's essentially like a therapist, they're trying to help you become yourself. Okay, and so we spent a year before we finished with a vision that's in the back of the pamphlet called Zingerman's 2009. Many of you know about this. If you're doing quick math in your head, you'll see that even though his question was, what are we doing in 10 years, we went 15. Why 2009? I don't know, because I'm weird and I don't like the straight up stuff. And many of you can remember when 2001, A Space Odyssey, that was the big movie at the time. And so 2009, A Food Odyssey seemed like a good <laughs> spin on it. But that vision is really what has made the organization what it is and where you're sitting would not exist without that vision. So that's why in a lot of ways, the story of Zingerman starts in 1993 and 1994, not really in 1982, because that's where we described having a community of businesses. That's where we described having businesses that each had their own specialty so we could keep the deli unique, but that we could grow. That's where we described having managing partners, which there's now whatever 18 of, who would own part of the business and not long-term managers with sort of a phony bonus plan that would entice them to stay longer, but people who actually were owners. And that's where the idea of operating with, by consensus at the partner level came from. And that's where the idea of putting synergy into place where each business, it wasn't just me and Paul investing in other businesses, which is a much more common model, but actually creating an organization where every element of the organization was contributing positively back to the others and where we would stay grounded in this community, not criticizing others, but just for me, <clears throat> opening in other cities becomes, going back to my Russian history background, a little too colonial. It's a little too expansionist. It's a little too much manifest destiny. It's there, so we should take it. And I'm, again, others could do what they want, but for me, for us, it's always been super important that we be grounded in the community. Now, everybody in the world has beliefs and stories and arguments and plans and ideas. Like, this is not difficult. <laughs> but what the visioning did was that it allowed us to move out of like, we should, we could, maybe, no, I don't know, yeah, well, uh, who's had those conversations, right? they're fine. But the problem is when there's no coherent story, it's very difficult to actually create something lasting and meaningful in a way that's true to who you are. So it's in 1993 and 94 that we wrote that vision. That's where we started to learn about visioning for the first time. Uh, we weren't very good at it. Uh, the 2009 vision's in the back of the new pamphlet. It's about six pages long. So one of the key things of the visioning work is it's not a four, no disrespect to the business school, I didn't go, but it's not a four or five line vision statement. This is a story. A story with emotionally meaningful detail woven in with facts and strategic decisions of your choosing. It's an inside out exercise. It's not what your mother wants. It's not what I want you to do. It's not what Rob wants you to do. It's not what everyone in your industry is doing. It's what you want to do. So there's no right or wrong vision. You could write a vision that says you're going to open all over the world and you could write a vision that says you never grow. They're both awesome. <laughs> because it's your life. And the key of our lives is that we can create what we want to create. Thelonious Monk, the jazz musician says, a genius is a person most like himself. 
and the visioning the way that we do it and that we learn from stash is a way to be the most like yourself because the other way is really just trying to figure out the right answer the way many of us were trained in school no disrespect to guess the right answer this is where there's no right answer except what's in here right and that we get to write our own story not select from multiple choice stories that the rest of the society or the world offers us. This sounds easy, but the reality is we're surrounded by people complaining, criticizing, acting like victims, blaming other people, and it's very hard to break out of that cycle. Uh, Rollo May, the psychologist, said the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. Mm -hmm. The opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. This is the reality of our world. People just follow along. <laughs> this is a lot of what drew me to anarchism in the first place was it was people trying to walk their own way. It's not chaos, it's not rock throwing, it's the opposite of that. It's about honoring everybody's humanity and dignity and allowing them to be part of the conversation regardless of age, race, income, gender, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just everybody matters and we could create through a vision a story in which that takes place. Is this making any sense? I'm going to pause for questions and then I'll do a little more and then we'll turn you loose on the world. Yes. Brian. Um, did stocks actually have like a quote that like, you know, one sentence that kind of causes paradigm to become enlightened in you or to be realized? Did Stash have one line? Yeah, they have like a quote that kind of like the light bulb moment, the aha, it's like, oh, I get it now. Did you actually say one thing? Where he got it or where I got it? Or, I mean, something that for you he said. Oh. I don't know, it's just, here, here's the question. If you don't know where you're going, what's going to happen? You don't know your destination, how you know you arrived? Well, it's not even how you know you arrived, you don't even know where you're going. So it's sort of like getting in the car, and every intersection you're having a big argument with the person in the car whether you should go left or right, and you're both correct. I mean, I, I'm not going to bother looking it up, but in the third book is the Alice in Wonderland story, which some of you uh, will know, right? So Alice is walking along the path, comes to a fork in the road, unsure of which direction to proceed in, sees the Cheshire cat in the tree, asks the cat, which way should I go? The cat appropriately asks back, where are you going? Alice says, I don't know. And the cat says, well, then any road will get you there. So it's, it's just, it's not the norm to get clear on where we're going. It's the norm to guess the answer, to, do, to, to, to parcel out the advice that we got from other people and then try to figure it out. And I think that what Stash did is just in his own gentle way was to start sharing this work that Ron Lippett had done 20 years before, 30 years before, about how to create a future for yourself rather than waiting for the future to happen, hoping it would work out, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody else had a question. Yeah. I was going to ask, um, how much pressure does the new year put on, on you? I, I just feel like around us, like it, it turns a new page for everyone. And does that oh, how much pressure? The new year doesn't put any pressure on me. Our fiscal year ends at the end of July. Uh, and one of the stories I'm going to tell, and I'll use that as a segue, is so when you write a vision, and a long, when you write a long-term vision, and again, we write them for everything, but when you write a long-term vision, I don't know, it's like the four-minute mark in the first quarter of an NBA game. Like, it matters, but <laughs> it's not like anything really happens. So... The, the vision is maybe the end of the season, but during the season, there's a lot of ups and downs. But uh, 
you know, my anarchism and my all, like whatever, those dates are just made up. <laughs> There's been lots of different calendars. The French Revolution, they completely changed it to be like 10 days in a week. They made the whole year on the decimal system. I mean, it's, it's really arbitrary. So uh, we could go with the other New Year's too. But here's the thing. So in uh, 1994, we wrote the vision for 2009. In 2007, we were almost at 2009, which was hard to believe. <laughs> and so by that point, though, Stosh had entered Zing Train and become a second managing partner with Maggie Bayless, who some of you know. We were already getting good at visioning. I'd been writing about it. We were teaching Zing Train seminars on it. So in 1993, when we engaged with Stosh, we didn't have a clue. <laughs> By 2007, we were pretty good at it. But we still needed to write a new one because one of the beauties of this process is it has a date on it. It ends, and then it's time to write another one. So what happened when Paul sat me on the bench is there was no end. <laughs> so it was only his intuition that told us it was time to write another one. Most organizations start because somebody had a dream. Awesome. Then they reach that point of midlife, but they never write another vision. So the story of what this is, metaphorically, what happens to them is in the big beliefs book, and it's the story of the Winchester, man what's now called the Winchester Mystery House, but was the Winchester Mansion. Has anybody been there, San Jose? So I, I've never actually been there. I just read about it and looked at pictures. But so the story of the Winchester Mystery House is that uh, in the 19th century, you've already heard of the Winchester repeating rifle. So Mr. Winchester inv invented that rifle. And then he and his wife, they be he became quite wealthy, and they were building a mansion for themselves. And he passed away suddenly in the middle of the construction of the mansion. And his wife, in her anxiety, uh, went to a mystic, to a seer, to figure out what was going to happen next in her panic. And the seer said, all of the souls of your the, the, all of the souls killed by the rifles your husband created are going to come and get you. <laughs> and the only way you can hold them at bay is to continue the construction of this mansion that your husband began. And as long as you keep the construction going, they'll leave you in peace. Okay? So that mansion, they just kept going and going and going. <laughs> Let me find you the numbers. But this is what happens, I would suggest to you, in businesses. So we look at the vision as the cathedral that we're working to construct. You all know the story, I'm sure, or most of you do, of, that I didn't make up of the Guy goes to Milan, to Italy, late 15th century. They're building the Duomo. And he comes to the first guy and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying stone. Comes to the next guy, what are you doing? I'm building a cathedral, right? Emotional, physically, is there any difference in the work these two people are doing? Emotionally, what's the difference? Yes, you're part of something special that makes a big difference. Okay, where did I put... So, the Winchester Mystery House is basically like the cathedral got finished, but the workmen keep... kept They just keep coming. <laughs> so you add your garage on the back, and then you read an article that says, let's add a third story, and then somebody says, well, I saw property values go up if you do this. And pretty soon the elegance of this original design that you had turns into a big hodgepodge and a mess. And why I can't find this, I don't know. But anyway, it ended up with the Winchester Mystery House, like 161 rooms, stairways that lead to nowhere, windows that open into other rooms, bathrooms that don't work, because the whole point became, like in many companies, just to keep working. So the original 
elegance of that original vision gets lost, and this is what you end up with. So in 2007, because we knew how to do visioning, we just wrote the next one. It took about 18 months. We weren't rushing. We're very inclusive and collaborative. We got about half the way we do it. We got about half the people in the organization participated. That vision was for 2020. Again, it's in the pamphlet. Fast forwarding again. By the way, when you get to the vision, it's a big deal. I still remember because I don't care, and we're open on New Year's Day anyway, and I was sitting in the deli next door on New Year's Day 2009, and I, some of you don't know, but I journal every morning, and I just, you know, I went in, it's just another day, like, I don't care, whatever, and so I go in, and I sit down, it's like 6.30 in the morning, and I get my legal pad out to journal, and I wrote 1-1-09, one, one, oh, and I cried because it's the completion of what you put your heart into. This is why people cry at their kid's wedding. This is why athletes cry when they win championships, because you've imagined this future and it's arrived. So in 07, we wrote the next vision for 2020. Many things, good things came out of that, uh, including employee ownership. It's the first time we wrote about diversity in an overt way in a vision. Uh, and then we, we started the work in 2018 on the next vision. We were going to do it for 2030 because part of the vision work can allow us to go past a big event. So Paul and I, like you, are getting older. That's a good problem. I'm not complaining. I prefer this one to the alternative. <laughs> but it's important because we have the privilege and opportunity to write a story is that we can write the story for our own departure and that by doing visioning, you don't have to just say it's next week or next month or next year. We wrote a, we're going to write a vision. So we said, okay, let's do 2030. It's far enough away that we're not going anywhere tomorrow, but it's close enough that it gives the other people some sense of what's going on. Maggie from Zinc Train said, well, if we go to 2032, it'll put us at 50 years. So that's what we did. So we started to work on the 2032 vision. And you know, things get in the way, whatever, so we're ready to roll it out. Uh, around this time, 2020, we planned for the big rollout meeting. Again, the way we work, everybody here has already seen dozens of drafts, but still need to mark the event with the formal rollout. We plan it for our huddle at the end of March 2020. We're laughing now, but we weren't laughing then. Rob brought up COVID, so you can all put yourselves back. You don't want to, but we can all put ourselves back to what was going on. Uh, the, the pamphlet, Working Through Hard Times, is my story of what happened uh, and how we started to get through it. I wrote it partway through the pandemic because I, as a history major, everybody writes from the end. I wanted to write from the middle when you really don't know what's going to happen as opposed to afterwards and you have all these wonderful lessons that you learn. But anyway, so uh, 2020, I thought that my, it was like my business life was passing in front of my eyes. Some of you will have had that experience. So we, you know, we're doing fine. We're not like the gazillionaires the world thinks we are, but we're okay. We got debt, but we got sales and we pay our bank payments and all of that. But all of a sudden, when your sales drop in half in four weeks, your debt that used to look really reasonable starts to look really big, right? And around that time, too, as I would call people to sort of try to reground in the chaos, a lot of them, you know, my friends jokingly trying to find a little humor in the darkness would go like, well, I guess you're going to have to write that new vision again. And I started to get even more nervous. I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And they're like, you know, somebody's like, yeah, I guess that new vision is not going to help you much now. And I kept going back and rereading, and I'm like, there's nothing to change. There's nothing to change. The vision is the story of the future that we want in 2032. It doesn't say we're not wearing masks. 
Like I didn't go to med school like my grandmother wanted me to, but thank God other people did and they figured out a vaccine. Awesome, whatever. People are gonna figure out solutions. My job is to stay focused on where we're supposed to be going. And so honestly, we made almost no change other than a few grammatical fixes, et cetera. And no joke, two years ago this week, just coincidence, we, we rolled it out. So that vision is in place for 2032. Uh, it's also in here. Uh, it talks about all kind of things, uh, including love in the workplace, which if you would have told me in 1982, I'd be talking about love in the workplace, I would have laughed at you, but now it's in our vision. So that's really where we're going. I got a few closing things, but I'm gonna let people ask questions or make comments and see if this is at all, is this helpful at all? Yeah. What do you want to know? You can do whatever you want. I'm an anarchist. <laughs> he, Rob wants to hear who you are though, and I'm going to help support Rob. Awesome. No. Yeah. Yeah. So the the question is how do metrics fit into this? So in hindsight, later on, one of the things Stash told me about how we evolved what he had taught us, and I don't think we even knew we were evolving it, is that we were very adamant about including some key metrics. So we put facts and feelings into the vision together, which in hindsight is awesome. Why? Because that's life. The fact that, like, that we have feelings is a fact. And we have feelings about facts. They're not these two, like it's portrayed, be rational is bullshit. So we put stuff in there. Now, does it have to be to the penny? No. So we wrote, I think in the 2009 vision that we would have 12 to 18 businesses in the Ann Arbor area by 2009, right? now. Could it have been 11? Yes. Could it have been 19? Yes. But the point is it wasn't 300 and it wasn't one. Okay. So having some sense of what success means to you matters. So we said to Ann Arbor area, it didn't say Dexter's bad or Celine's bad, but I could, yes, Chicago, awesome. I, you know, still root for the bulls or whatever, but it's too far. Detroit, no disrespect. It's too far. It's another culture and another ecosystem. It doesn't mean your vision is that you don't want to open there. It just means that's my art. So we're very adamant about putting both in together. Which facts? The ones that matter. And what matters to me might easily not matter to you, and that's okay. Does that help? Hi, uh, Matthew Mike's uh, EQ by I'm so sure I help people with their visioning of taking scientific virtualization. Uh, I'm curious about uh, how important is a, a book I read to shape the way you sell. And you talked about setting goals, you bike from Seattle down to Patagonia. But I'm curious, um, you know, how important is it to share your vision? You know, oh, how important is it to share your vision? It's extremely important. <laughs> it's it's extremely important enormously important. Uh, I can't say that not sharing it precludes it from happening, but the power is in the sharing because who here has had a thought about something they might want to do, but they didn't tell anybody and they didn't do it? Okay, like this is, it's, of course. And who here has announced to the world they were doing something and then had second thoughts, but you stuck with it? Okay, so like it's just the reality. So there's the downside of social pressure, but there, everything has, so natural law number 11 is that strengths lead to weaknesses. So there's the downside of social pressure, but there's the upside of social pressure, which is if we say we're doing this, 
doesn't mean we have to, but I don't know about you, but I got a lot more motivation to get it done if I committed to the organization and to the community and the world that I'm going to do it. And I meant what I said, I'm going to stick with it. So I, I think it's very powerful. It's also very powerful to share it because people can help you. So a lot of my belief from anarchism and everything, which is now becoming commonly accepted in science, is the opposite of the inaccurate belief that underlies modern economics, no disrespect if you're an econ economist, that it's a war of all against all that came from Thomas Huxley. Huxley it's, it's not accurate. We're all in this together. Adam Grant, Peter Kropotkin, they're all of these studies coming out that show that collaboration leads to creativity and to long-term health. So people want to help you. That's my belief. The problem is when you don't have a vision that they know about, it's called advice. <laughs> like your mother had a vision for your life. And she tried hard <laughs> to get you to follow her advice. That's her vision. The problem is it might not have been yours. But if we, nature abhors a vacuum. If we don't have our own vision, they just keep giving us advice how to do what they think we should do. When you have a vision, it's much clearer. It's also much clearer to the organization. So when people join the organization but they don't know what the vision is, A, who cares? B, they're making up their own vision. So part of our vision being clear that, like Maggie always would say, like it's so critical that it says we're only open in the Ann Arbor area and we're only going to have one of each business because it would be a very common story for people in the business world to have made up to say like, these guys are, they're awesome, man. They're going to open all over the country. I'm going to get in now. And then when they go public, I'm going to hit it big. But you could say, here's the vision. We're not doing that. You're, I love your vision, it's just not compatible. So there's, it's super powerful and it also helps you hold course. Because I don't know about you, but my mind is like, like when people are like focused, it's like my mind is in 7,300 places at the same time all the time. So it's easy for me to imagine a million different things, but this is the blueprint for what we're constructing. So try to imagine that you change the blueprint on your house that you are building every couple weeks when you read a new article. <laughs> like they'll keep coming and you'll keep paying them, but you're not gonna end up with anything elegant and beautiful. So yes is the answer. Hi. Hi, um, stand up, I'm Stacy. Hi um, Stacy. And I'm leading two Back to Back Vision Board events with a bunch of women in my community. And I awesome. four hours with them. So when you said 18 months, I was like, wow, that is a commitment. So I would love to- Well, it's not like we weren't doing anything else oh, during- <laughs> Yeah. So my second would be, how do you know when your vision is right? Like, we are going to launch this now. Okay. Did you hear the question or should I repeat it? Okay. So my favorite parts. So one thing I wanted to tell, and you've given me a good entree, is, the, is how we write it. And we learned this from Stash. He called it hot pen. It's described in part one of the book, which is the yellow one, and then again in part three, which is on managing ourselves because there's an essay on personal visioning. So hot pen, if I'm not an English major, I'm a history major, but if you were an English major, you already learned this, it's called free writing. If you're an engineer, not from Menlo, it's very difficult for you because you can't imagine just sitting down and writing something without knowing what it is you're supposed to write properly to get the right answer. Having taught this all over the world, I'll stereotype and say engineers have the most trouble with visioning the first time because they're like, I don't know what to write. It's like, I know you don't fucking know what to write. That's the point. <laughs> visioning is commonly misperceived as figure out your vision and then write it down. It's actually the opposite. You write, you figure it out by writing it. So hot pen means like if you come to the two day Zing train seminar where we guide you through this so that you can't come up with 600 excuses and get caught up on Instagram and forget you're supposed to write your future. 
or decide to watch a football game instead of writing your future or all the other myriad distractions that we all have readily available to us, it would be 45 minutes of free writing, non-stop. The key is you must keep writing. So if you ride a bicycle, what happens if you stop pedaling? You fall over. That's what happens with the writing. If you stop to think, it won't work. It's just a draft, the first version. There's no obligation to do what you wrote, but the best stuff will come out near the end because you have gotten past all of the conscious bullshit that we all have in our heads. The faster you write, the better it goes. I just write a lot of swear words when I don't know what to write. You could write the, you could write the Lord's Prayer. You could write the Detroit Tigers starting lineup, but you have to fucking keep writing. And I've, I've taught this a million times. Rich has seen it and whatever. I'm looking for where I put my pen down. But I'll see people. I'm like, holding your pen, looking at the ceiling is not writing. <laughs> so you could write, this is the stupidest fucking thing I ever did, but fucking keep writing. And so if you don't write, it doesn't work. So that's the power. That's the power. And I guarantee everybody in this room knows what they want. The problem is it's buried under a thousand other people's stories. It's buried under advice and recommendations and everybody who told us it won't work and why and our fears, which I have plenty of, for why I'll fail and I don't want to tell anybody and that's why I resisted in the first place. But we know in our hearts what we want. But we get trained to look for the right answer. And I, in the back of the beliefs book is the commencement speech that Paul and I did. And I'm like, like everybody, when you graduate college, what does everybody ask you? Yeah, it's the wrong question. The question is, what kind of life do you want to create? What you want to do may be a part of that. Awesome. But you could be an engineer or an artist or a historian and act like a jerk. Or you could be an engineer, artist, and a historian and contribute to the community. That your job title's the same, but it doesn't tell me the story that you want to create for your life. So the question is, what do you want to create? I'm trying to work more. I'm running out of time. I got a lot to do. Other people want to work less. It's not a judgment of how much work you do. The question is, do you, what do you want to do? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know, I'm tr I'm, but I'm ant you tell me, I'll do whatever you want. Uh, I'm Terrence from the Chelsea Area Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to ask about sustainability. We spoke about, you know, literally giving a number of the number of businesses you wanted by 2000. Well, it was a range, though. Sure. Yeah. And so I guess I'm just curious uh, if you ran into instances where you had a very specific vision, even if it isn't a range, and you get to that date, and it's 1-1-2009, you didn't come close. What does that look like? Well, hopefully you would know before you got to the date that you, were, <laughs> that you weren't that close. So like if you're, pick your metaphor, if you're running a marathon, I don't, I run, but I don't run organized stuff. But if you're running a marathon and you know what your mid-range time is, midpoint time is supposed to be, and you're behind, what do you do? You speed up. Now, the, there's no reason you can't rewrite your vision partway through. It's just if you rewrite your vision every time you have self-doubt, I would rewrite it every 15 minutes. So it's, it's, it's allowing you to hold course. Now, I mean, some stuff doesn't happen. And I just told the story. I did a class for Sounds True uh, for Tammy Simon on line yesterday. And somebody asked about visioning. And I, it's, it's, it's remarkable when you really come from the heart and you get buy-in from by sharing it with the people around you. Like, it, it, it's not magic. There's a lot of work to do. But when your decisions are easier to make, you are not Alice in Wonderland like this every day. And when people know how to help you, good things ha happen. The odds are way higher. And I told the story of somebody who used to work here uh, who wrote a personal vision. I don't remember. It was five years out. A year or two later, she went through a very difficult divorce. And I talked to her six, seven years later, and she said, the remarkable thing is everything I wrote happened. 
It just was with a different person. So in our hearts, we know what we want. And this is, it's, it's just the business world is teaching us to guess the answer. And so no, like you got a nice business right behind you there. So like writing a vision for Chelsea that's like looking at other cities and what are they all doing and let's take everybody's best practices is like me cooking for you by picking the best of 20 other dishes instead of going like, what's in here? Now I need knowledge of cooking in order to make that happen, but a good cook is coming from the heart and a good vision is coming from the heart. So forget what everybody else does, I'm saying that metaphorically. And make, how do you make Chelsea this most amazing version of Chelsea. It's not Manhattan, it's not Ann Arbor, it's not whatever. Like when people come to Chelsea in 10 years or 20 years, because you might go 20 years down the road, what's it feel like? How do people talk to you on the street? How do business owners feel about working there? And the problem in every metropolitan thing or every political thing is <laughs> the vision changes every two to four years. And it's difficult, and I don't have an easy answer for that. I'm not recommending that we go back to monarchy. But it's very hard here to make cultural change in a relatively healthy organization. I think it takes usually three to four years. So I'm like, how can you do it in the country when one day we're going to LA and four years later we're going to New York and we just end up going nowhere? <laughs> so I'm going to close uh, to Rob's suggestion. Uh, the beauty of this is the, the next vision is ready to be written. The processes are all in the books or whatever. You could probably find some YouTube talks online that I did, whatever. But the power is there. You can teach this to your kids. I wish I knew how to do this at eight. I can't believe they let us into University of Michigan without writing a vision for our four years. It has nothing to do with the profession you'll pursue, but it's all about the relationships you're gonna create, how you feel about yourself. Like, the, how do they let you pay uh, whatever God knows what it is now without any sense of where you're going? It doesn't make any sense. And I tried to tell one of our sister hosts who's having anxiety attacks about her college application. Like, you know what to do, write a vision. Oh, you have to write an essay. <laughs> 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 like, write a vision. Like, can you imagine out of all the applications, probably some of you are of all the applications they get, and yours says it's 2027, and I'm wrapping up the most amazing four years of my life. I met so many wonderful people. I'm like, whoa, blow your mind. <laughs> but the funny thing is, the next week there was a woman in who was like, I don't know her name, but who actually goes, I work in the, in the admissions department. And I'm like, what if this happens? She goes, oh, that would be incredible. You know how many bad essays they write? <laughs> so, anybody read Dune? So, Frank Herbert said, there is no real ending. It's just a place where you stop the story. So I'm going to close with a brief one minute, two minute story, which is that yesterday, uh, and this is a whole other talk, so we can come back and get into it more. But yesterday we did the formal rollout, uh, and I read the vision aloud of the perpetual trust that we have created, uh, which will make the Zingerman's intellectual property self-owned.